we need to get back to work. And work is one of the ways that we contribute to this country, that we grow our GDP, we grow our tax base, we contribute to each other effectively, we help finance our national security, our homeland security, our, you know, our infrastructure. I had key employees that really wanted to be leaders in the company, but they didn't want to have any ownership and responsibility that way. So yep. I just had to start researching out and, and figuring out, well, how do I market my company? Go to your local school board, one, for one hour twice this year. And if you can have even just 10 or 15 employers show up and do that at the same school board, every single month there's two contractors filling out a little card to, to, to give your 30 seconds at the podium that says, I need your help and we have great jobs. Eventually they will hear you. But if everyone just did two hours a year, that's how we change this. Stacy, how you doing this morning? I'm doing great. <laughs> she loves it. I ask the question every time. She's like, I'm fine, dude. Just uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little much. And I say to that owner, I said, I said, so you're not willing to invest in yourself? You're not going to invest in yourself. You're going to invest in companies you have no control over, whereas your company you control, and you don't have the confidence to pour the money into that. When things are busy and they're looking for their GC friends to sit down and negotiate a project when GC and the fee, and they're more excited about building the project. And then all of a sudden the model, the market swings. And now the developer market is going to go out and they're going to hard bid the same project to two or three different GCs. And that's where, that's where it starts going down. It's morning huddle time. Chad Prinky here with Kelly Ennis. Kelly, how are you this morning? I'm great, Chad. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. So Kelly is... Um, the managing partner of the Verve Partnership, uh, which is an interior architecture and design firm in the Baltimore uh, and sort of, I guess, mid-Atlantic region. You're doing work, um, yeah. not just here locally, but regionally. Um, Kelly, what's what's going on in your world these days? Oh, a lot, a lot is going on uh, in our world, proverbially speaking. Um, we are busy and we are busy uh, trying to help people figure out what the next step is with their office strategies. Uh, awesome. It's keeping us, yeah, it's keeping us really busy. So that's what we're going to be digging into today is really the future of the office, um, which is, you know, maybe a played out uh, discussion intensely over the past couple of years. But I, I think uh, we're at a place where we're ready to stop talking about what might be happening and we're ready to start talking about what is happening, right? And tangibly, yes. this is what is going on. And to your point, this isn't conjecture. This isn't stuff that we're imagining, but this is what's keeping the Verve partnership busy right now. This is what's keeping uh, firms like yours and, and the construction industry can expect to see a lot of stuff coming down the line. I know the, you know, the office market uh, never uh, went away during the, the, you know, uh, the pandemic, but there, there was certainly a lot, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. Have you seen that uncertainty kind of, um, you know, start to dissipate at this point? I think the uncertainty is, wait, is definitely waning. Um, people, um, people are itching to get back. People perform it, perform better face to face. Uh, people uh, react better face to face. It's, it's just all across the board from a culture standpoint. Um, people need people. And we need to be together. Virtual was great. It served a need. Um, but it also uh, proved a lot of things that we have been working on our entire careers. Um, that hybrid does, in fact, work. Uh, culture, if you're designing and planning to a culture, um, that works. If you have flexible work from home policies, that works. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing it all come back, um, come back to the forefront. Yeah, it's, and it's a really... It's a good point. It's that in, in the office environment, depending on the type of business you are, right, you were already running hybrid work. Yes. That, was, that was happening as it, as it was heading into the pandemic. Certain positions maybe weren't used to working from home or, or working from anywhere, what, you know, whatever that means. But uh, specifically, as we think about our audience, which is made up largely of construction companies, general contractors, subcontractors, uh, and to another extent, you know, architecture and, enge and, and engineering and design firms. Um, there's a field aspect 
mm-hmm. to, to, to being, you know, a construction company where depending on the company, it could be the majority of your workforce is yeah. actually, you know, not working from the office. So, right. um, <laughs> that was something when you and I were talking, I was like, right, duh. You know, that's, if that's not, I guess that's hybrid. Um, right. It's, it's some version thereof, uh, but it's still, you know, but what I will say is this, and this is something I'd be interested in your comment on is, is, is that I have noticed, and, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about over, over the years that there is a little bit of a divide between the office and the field. I wish there weren't. And in some companies there isn't, but there's a bit of a divide between the office and the field. And, uh, and, and I do think that there's some aspect of that that just goes to the fact that they're not working side by side every day. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, weigh in on the balance. How do we pull off hybrid correctly? How do we, how do we make sure that we're not now having a divide between the office and the office? Um, you know, and so on. So, so that's, that's a lot of questions to answer. <laughs> so, um, so a couple things. Um, what we have to understand uh, in the marketplace, generally speaking, that each market is, is different. You have, you know, law firms that were, um, you know, slow, slower to uh, the, the hybrid, um, the hybrid office. Um, but on the flip side, uh, you know, like you said, your general audience, Hybrid's just a new word. <laughs> um, people were uh, had hybrid and flexible work from anywhere options, but hybrid is simply just a new word that's in response to the pandemic. <clears throat> uh, in the general contracting field, like you said, you have people in the field all the time. You have project managers some of the time, and then you have um, you know the corporate and headquarters kind of staff who is actually in the office occupying space. You know. 70, 80% of the time. So the the differentiator is, is really understanding the strategy of the market with which we are designing and planning to. Um, each market is a little bit different. Um, and like you said, um, in the in the general contracting world, um, you know, they've been doing hybrid technically for a very long time. It just wasn't right. hybrid, right? It just wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's talk about strategy a little bit yep. more. Um, when you say designing to strategy, mm-hmm. what does that mean in, in real terms when it comes to, uh, how your clients are looking at their office space? Yep. Um, we dig deep to figure out who's working where, how they are working and where they are working best and most uh, productively. So different people can work at different times of day more effectively um, and in different kinds of spaces. Um, You know, this is again, this is not all this is not new information. Uh, You know, we've been planning for different settings. And I say settings, that is a setting as a private office, a setting as a workstation, a setting as a as a huddle room, as a conference room. Mm. Um, And there are many, many, many different kinds of settings where throughout the course of the day, People can work differently and possibly work better. We were not really meant to sit in a box and be corralled in little squares, um, quite frankly, like cattle working, um, you know, sitting in an office all day long. We're, we're just not programmed that way as human as human beings. So to have that differentiator throughout the course of the day, um, it, it's choosing how you want to work and where you want to work. And, you know, people are just generally happier that way, which is why the work from home piece of it um is is really successful i myself work from home every morning i don't even go into the office until later this afternoon my head's downtime is at my house interesting so i i i think what you're saying i is in intuitively true like i believe that um but it's not it's so antithetical to the traditional mm-hmm. you know th- thought process uh, of the office. And so I don't know, I, mean, I, I recognize you, know, you keep on prefacing things by saying like, this isn't new, and, and, but, but it is kind of new to me. I'm not an expert in what you're talking about. And, and I'm guessing there's probably a lot of our guests, or I'm sorry, a lot of our audience that um, this is kind of new for. Uh, I, when, when I think about this, I'm, I'm like, were we prioritizing for, for you know, decades just sort of productivity and maximize like pr- 
maximizing space as the way of achieving productivity or something like that. Like what, what hard data started to, to, you know, create this strategy first approach that you're using? Uh, so again, lots of questions um, with lots of answers. Um, we can start with um, how people work differently and uh, the data that supports it is really uh, catering to the, the culture of the individual industries, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, like, you know, law firms are a really good example. Um, for a very, very long time, um, the, the, the law industry, if you will, um, people didn't work outside of their office. If they weren't sitting in their office, they were clearly not being billable, which is a right. very, it's a very huge metric uh, in, in the legal industry. Um, whereas what the pandemic proved is that people can actually work quite effectively from their house or from different areas. So when we talk about, um, the, the data, um, the, the data is more in kind of an organizational development cate category. Um, but if you, if you can, you can track productivity, um, and you can track performance and, and that's where, you know, the whole performance review thing comes up and, and, uh, people track those metrics and in the construction, again, I'm going to kind of go back to the construction field because it's a perfect example. People usually aren't in the office when they're working in the field, they're right, working well, on right. a dedicated project. And if that project coming out of the ground doesn't keep track with a schedule or keep track with milestones or, uh, keep track with expectations, it's very apparent, very similar in professional services. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and. So I, as I think about, yeah, I don't know. I, I know you've actually had some experience in building for, mm -hmm. uh, or designing for builders, mm -hmm. which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. What are some of the things that you have, that you would call out that you've done when you're designing for builders? In this case, it's general contractors. I don't know if you've done subcontractor uh, spaces, but talk about the space that you've done for general contractors, some of the trends um, there. Yep. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in designing and planning uh, for general contractors, we've done two here in, in the in the region. Uh, it's very important uh, to have shared collaborative spaces, uh, project room kind of spaces, huddle, huddle spaces, where both you have, you know, this kind of technology, so you can, you know, throw up a plan um, and, you know, have your team and your subcontractors join uh, in the office. Both right. Virtually. People are out in the field. We yep. want to be able to bring them right into the people who are in the office and have yep. this sort of seamless meeting on, on the spot. Yep. yep. So technology is, is really important, but you also have a myriad of generations and sometimes actually seeing a physical plan, you know, that is 30 by 42, 36 by 48, you need some big desk space. You need some big meeting space to actually drill down and look at the, you know, the analog nature of what plans are telling you. Um, I'm a paper person. I like to look at paper. I like to review drawings um, in paper and I need a big desk to do that um, or a big uh, meeting table to do that with my peers. Same, same with general contractors. So again, it kind of goes back to, you can't do it at your desk room, but creating those project room and project areas where people can get out of their desk, go to a common table and just kind of dig in and, you know, solve problems. Are you seeing anybody that's, that makes total sense at what, what you're describing. Um, and I've definitely been in you know, my client's offices, general contractors, subcontractors, different spaces and, and, and felt constrained, you know, at, when, when they don't have the right space Right. for stuff and and we're cramming into an area or you can see the mm -hmm. frustration on the face of that person who's tr who is a paper person who's trying to get the plans open and talk about them and and um and so I, and and then i i have been in actually in, in fact in some of uh, your client spaces um and uh felt the exact opposite sort of felt like this oh, this enablement of what it is that we're going so it matters it really really matters and so uh, I can I can sense when it's done right. Here's a little bit of a sidewinder, uh, and I have to ask: Is anybody actively talking about and planning for like? Uh, uh, <laughs> oh God, I'm going to sound terrible, but like germ-free kind of uh, solutions in the office? Are they? Are they? Uh, like, 
is that going to be a thing where people are thinking about like, okay, and so how do we adjust when we need to, you know, isolate each other? Like, I'm just really afraid that we're all going to become extremely OCD germaphobes and their office spaces are going to accommodate the insanity. So um, I think you, I think you had people like that before the pandemic. Um, <laughs> right. Not, yeah, right? um, and the whole kind of the, uh, the shared desk kind of thing you know, that that's, you know, we're seeing not our clients, but, you know, out there on the street with um, other, you know, articles that I'm reading is, okay, I always have like this little kit, like, okay, um, that's great. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to air, air circulation, right. air exchange. Um, and, and I often say, you know, we can design and plan and develop strategies all day long. If you're in a class C building from 1988, that has horrible uh, rooftop units or um, any any sort of HVAC systems that are not, um, you know, high of higher quality. It's about air, so you got to balance design and strategy with the quality of the air. That is the biggest component that should that will be addressing um, any sort of kind of phobias that people may or may not have. Um, you know, we can design and plan all day long, but if you're still circulating bad bad air. You know, that's that's a whole different conversation. That's a really fair point. And I and I do I think it, it is um, uh, the, the mechanical systems that mm -hmm. you have in place, the HVAC systems that you have in place. Uh, th those are going to be the places where you actually keep people healthier. The rest of it's just kind of policy, right? Like, you yeah. know, wash your hands. Uh, you know, and, and, and other, uh, you know, That's simple for kids, right. When they're five years old, <laughs> not Watch super complicated. I'm just, it, it's, it, it just fascinates me. I just picture this world where we walk into offices and everything's like, you know, everybody's hermetically sealed in their envelope. And, and I'm like, that, that doesn't seem, that seems actually like we should all go back home. <laughs> yeah, that's not the intent. That's not yep. the intent. Um, all right. Uh, so what can contractors uh, start to think about and expect in terms of materials, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, things that they need to be, um, you know, see as you're on the design end, things that they need to be prepared to see coming down the pike when it comes to office uh, construction, in, in, you know, in, in the least for foreseeable future. Qual qualify materials for me. So what, what kinds of um, uh, materials are you seeing specified? Uh, that, is, anything, is anything new being specified? Is there anything coming down the line in terms of, you know, technology that's being specified? Is there, you know, like, uh, I hope that answers your question. I'll, I'll shut up for a second. Well, I mean, to, to some degree, I think um, I, I'm going to go back with air. I think um, yep. our peers and our consultants really, we all need to um, either be re-educated or hone in on what we already know uh, about air quality and air exchange rates. I think that is key. Um, in the healthcare industry, which we don't, we, we don't practice, um, we're not in the healthcare market sector, but from a material standpoint, you know, there's a lot of, you know, um, topical antimicrobial kind of solutions already built in with, say, within textiles and wall coverings that you okay. use, you know, in a hospital type situation. Um, so some you of know, that stuff may be adopted. Yeah. Yeah. Adopt, adopt some of the um, design solutions that, um, you know, that, that the healthcare industry um, has been using um, over time. Um, but I, I still go right back to air every time. I, like I said, we can design and specify all day long. If the air is still not clean, it's, yep. it's not helping. Yeah, it's not helping you. Um, uh, along those lines, one of the things that I have uh, actually recently seen, and gosh, I feel so guilty that I can't plug the company. I wasn't, in, I wasn't anticipating this opportunity uh, to do so. But there is um, uh, a company that I recently became aware of that is actually uh, uh, releasing so they're, they're they're basically monitoring air exchange um it room by room installing these sort of sensors and then it becomes sort of controlled by an application mm -hmm. and that then becomes something that you can use to make decisions about how to set up your mechanical systems um moving forward and i just i think that type of internet of things um you know uh, a solution for 
uh, air exchange is something that we're going to see become very normal. Uh, I know they're hoping it will be. Yep. <laughs> they are. They are. I think I probably know who you're talking about. But yes, th those types of tools and technology can only can only better all of our situations. Yeah, right on. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so w what is the importance? Uh, OK, well, I'll put it this way. The importance of a, of a well-integrated virtual in-person meeting space, that space that you described that I think, you know, hey, we can uh, easily pull our members of the field right into our conference space and we can have this collaborative meeting and it doesn't feel like a mess when we do it. That's obviously really important. Um, but what, how else is space changing? You talked a little bit earlier about um, you know, different settings, you know, um, how else is space changing to touch all employees? Okay. So that's not a one-sided comment and I'm kind of monitoring some of the comments in the chat over here, which are I extremely fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to go to, a, I'm, <laughs> Can't I'm help go, I know I do the same yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to a, um, kind of a, uh, just a comment that I've been um, writing a piece on is really honing in on the co-working mindset. So one of our verticals is co-working and innovation. And in, in that type of space, it's a highly flexible, highly amenitized, highly um, collaborative uh, type of space where people can move about through, move about throughout the course of the day with with some level of structure but with also some level of freedom and i keep going back to you know if we're designing spaces where people actually want to be and you couple that with a policy or a co-working mindset mm. um people still need to have face-to-face -face meetings <clears throat> in order to be successful, especially in design and construction, when you have to touch things, you know, you have materials, you have, you have building materials, you have furniture in our world. It, to do all of that virtually is not always, is not always going to work. So having the options and the policies to have a co-working mindset in a typical corporate office I think is really going to be beneficial. Um, co-working spaces at the moment are, are really, not that they weren't already taking off already, um, but the well-run, very well-organized, I mean, co-working is not just only about two and three person offices anymore. You know, we're, we're designing spaces that have a huge centralized core of all kinds of meeting spaces, you know, a bar, a training room, um, a place to have, um, you know, board meetings, and then smaller huddle rooms across the way, phone rooms. Um, and then you know your companies that are occupying up to three and six thousand square feet have access to these. It it really is you know what's the mindset and what's the policy, and yeah. then then design and plan space where people actually want to be to entice them back into the office. Asian, that, Asian isn't that isn't Sorry, that a funny ahead. term too? to entice them back into the office. Such a fun, like, that. We, it's, it's like, come on, we, we gotta, it's it's real nice in here. Um, I'm gonna pull Stacy in, and when I do that, I wanna make uh, one quick comment, just that I think the importance of the, the types of space that you do create in your office in this hybrid work environment, which by the way, again, in the construction industry, we've been having for a long time. Have you been creating space where people want to get together, uh, where the, the uh, culture organizes opportunities to pull people together. Uh, because I will tell you, the one thing that does worry me, I can't help it, maybe I'm a little old school, I'd be open to people picking on me uh, uh, for it. But I gotta tell you, I think when the, we only see each other virtually and we get together extremely rarely, that it does erode on some level my sense of, um, what's the right word? Loyalty, perhaps, or connection with yep. an organization and with, and maybe with my direct boss or the people that I work with. And it makes it much easier for me to kind of, um, I don't know, not be a part of the culture or, or in some way be detached. It makes it easier. It kind of, you know, I'm, I'm afraid it might amplify some of the job hopping, uh, that, that, you know, I think is, uh, you know, sometimes necessary, obviously, but, but overall economy wide unproductive. Um, 
Stacy, we've got, I'm seeing a super active uh, chat situation going on. Um, so uh, yeah. why don't you channel some of these questions into Kelly while we have her? Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little late here. Um, yeah, we have some great um, interaction. Everyone's just commenting on, you know, the status, whether they're remote or 50-50 or mostly in the office. But it's just kind of funny, you know, if I asked this question uh, prior to the pandemic, I pretty much think we would all say we were in the office 100%. So definitely a lot of change. Um, we did have a good question from Bill Wilson. Um, he said, are you seeing a change in staff density or sense of separation in office design? So that's, I, I did see that come through. Um, so um, the, the challenge to, an to answering that question is because our approach is always about strategy uh, and asking the right questions. If your office was overly dense, that tells me somebody wasn't asking the right questions. A lot of your technology companies were using something called like, a, it's called a benching system where each person only had four or five feet and then people would jam pack themselves in there. We don't approach space like that um, because each, like I said, each person works differently. And if you can kind of find a baseline, um, it shouldn't, I mean, the, the bottom line answer is yes, it should be less dense than it was. I would say a good 60 to 70% of spaces out there pre-pandemic were way too dense. Um, I think you're going to see less dense spaces, but you're going to see a rise in the common spaces. Like the, I go back to the co-working mindset, the shared, highly amenitized meeting zones, coffee zones, bar, conference, conference areas. Um, to accommodate for flexibility and less dense and less dense spaces. So the quick answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I'm but I'm hearing you say that yes, comma because people were just smushed together in a yeah. lot of these situations, not because we're 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 becoming you know uh, whatever we need to separate more now after the pandemic or something, but it, it's actually created a little bit of uh, awareness. You yes, know. awareness is a good is a good word. Yep. Um, I'm see did you see this question from Dennis, uh, Stacy, Dennis Kasich about pool planning and such like that? Um, it says, I'll, I'll just read it off here. It's, it says we, yeah. Dennis says we found some types of meetings must be in person. Things like pool planning, scheduling, commissioning meetings during this type of meeting, you may need, uh, you need many people to be able to join and remote has its drawbacks. So so, you know, not a not an explicit question therein, but but, you know, uh, agree, disagree. What are you seeing? Kelly? Agree. I absolutely agree. People <clears throat> we, face to face works because it's quicker. Um, you can and you can solve a lot more problems in a lot less time face to face. I absolutely agree. Remote's good. Virtual is good. I mean, we're here doing this virtually right now anyway, you know, right. so um, but when we meet face to face, it's much more effective and it's much more efficient use of time and you get to problem solving quicker. And I see that as a common theme over here on the on the chat. Um, you know, people like to work at home and they like to go in for face to face meetings. Um, that's that's usually the case, even pre pandemic. Um, so I think a I lot would... of policies will change as a result. So this isn't uh, uh, necessarily the, the focus of this show, but I have to say this, which is if you're going to bring people in for in-person meetings, make sure they don't suck. Make sure yeah. that you're capitalizing on the opportunity to actually plan a good meeting, execute a good meeting, and do stuff in the meeting that can't really actually be done very well uh, virtually that elevate the quality of the meeting, like getting up and using a whiteboard or like, uh, you know, uh, using sticky notes and, and right. You're doing a pool planning session, you know, th those different types of things. If you're going to get people together in person, just make sure that everybody doesn't look at each other and be like, dude, that could have been an email. But I, I think with that, with that said, I think it's also leaving some time for um, some social interactions that you may have missed. Um, because when you're not together, like you said, you said this a little bit earlier, Chad, you're not together when you can't see people physically, um, that, that's a, it's challenging, right? So when you are together physically, just set aside some time for, you know, some small talk or a cup of coffee um, and make sure people are engaged, you know, pre, during and after 
the meeting um, because that's how we reestablish some of the connections that we lost because, you know, we were home for almost two years. So, Love it. Yeah. Love it. That's great stuff. Stacy, what else we got? Yeah, I have a quick question. So um, meeting spaces, you talk a lot about um, the future of work being very collaborative. Is there any need for... Like, I just worry about, you know, you're trying to draw people back into the office, but there's people that still want the collaboration, but also independent space. Mm -hmm. are, they, are you seeing like, I don't know if I missed that in the first 10 minutes, so I apologize. Uh, so that's going to boil down to uh, policies. Um, what, what are your work from home policies? Or, um, you know, Steelcase termed this uh, phrase years, almost 20 years ago, developing me, me spaces, my spaces, me spaces, and we spaces. Mm -hmm. And having those dedicated desks or dedicated, you know, phone rooms, quiet rooms, small one and two person rooms, where that is heads down space. So it's really, and, and again, it's very, very dependent uh, on, on the market sector. Um, but having a healthy balance of me and we spaces as it applies to the the organization that we are working with is critical to this to the success of of all the organizations that we work with only because everybody works differently mm -hmm. and you know general contractors work differently than accountants you know accountants work differently than architects and designers so that's where the strategy piece comes back in and programming programming a space properly and really drilling under drilling down and understanding where people work when they work and what makes them uh, you know the most productive uh, with a high performance value. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Funny. Isn't it? Yeah, I, not not for me. Not for uh, me. At 11 o'clock, I am guaranteed to be snoring. So, <laughs> so um, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I'm laughing about as, as I'm thinking through this whole, like, I don't envy your role sometimes, Kelly, where you, you, if you're starting with strategy first and you're talking to people about culture and then you're building a space to, to match their culture, what happens when you come in and you're like, oh man, these guys have serious cultural problems. Do you build a dysfunctional space or like, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to, I mean, we, we drill down um, on what those, it's usually a communication problem. It's you, nine times out of 10 all about communication. And uh, we have consultants um, who are better equipped than we are to actually address um, address those kinds of challenges. And we bring them on our team as part of the, the workplace strategy process, because then you can veer off into two different problem sol solving methods. And then when you come back, the space aligns, uh, you know, aligns with those challenges. But it's usually about communication is where the disconnect and the culture happens. That's a really, that's a really good point. You know, I've noted, and I see this, you know, comment here about, you know, we have beautiful break rooms, but very few, very few people actually use them. You know, one of the, and I've seen this a ton, you know, where we'll, I'll, I'll be in a, a client's office or a potential client's office or whatever. And I'll, I'll be like, oh my gosh, this is a gorgeous space. And they're like, yeah, we never use that. And, and, <laughs> You know, it's it's it, when it comes to this type of stuff, it's not if you build it, they will come no. unless it was a part of your culture. Um, well, you're, you, you creating collaborative spaces won't make you a collaborative company. You know? Right. So the, the interesting thing on that aspect is if your senior leadership is not using those spaces that they just, you know, paid a bunch of money to design and plan, it's follow the leader. If the leaders of those organizations are not using the spaces that they designed for their teams, then nobody's going to use them because there's a preconceived, there's a, pre a, a, a conception right. that if, if my boss isn't using the space, then I, I, oh my gosh, I can't be seen working on my laptop, right. drinking coffee in a break room. Totally. Yeah. Um, we have a ping pong table, but because the bosses never use the ping pong table, yeah. the ping pong table never gets used. <laughs> exactly. there is, there's a, there's a culture, there's an awesome yep. book. Um, uh, I do, oh man, I'm not having a hard time pulling it. Uh, that is about primal leadership that has different leadership styles, uh, you know, and in, in, in pace setting leaders, right? It's exactly what you're talking. And in construction, I see a ton of pace setting leaders, right? They're, they are hard charging. They set the standard. Everybody respects them because they work really hard, right? All these different types of things. And in construction, if we want to attract people to have this better work-life balance and this better sense of contribution and this more, you know, connection and collaboration, all those types of things, because we're desperately trying to get people and keep people, the, those leaders need to uh, build those spaces and leverage those spaces, set yeah. the pace that doing that is cool. And it's, and yeah. it's actually a part of what we want to encourage here. 
Yeah. It's such a it's such a good point that uh, you know it could be as simple as a boss just taking a moment. Yeah, um, really easy, easy stuff. Really, yeah, exactly. yeah, you're like, yeah, dumb, <laughs> dumb, easy. easy, yeah, easy. Like, why aren't we doing this? Uh, this has been awesome, uh, Kelly. Thank you so much uh, for you. this conversation. I am not shocked that we went over, um, but uh, you know, I think I, I sincerely hope that our audience took had some really cool takeaways. Construction companies thinking about how they create office spaces that match what they're trying to become uh, as yes. businesses. So uh, again, Kelly is with the Verve Partnership. She is an absolute rock star. Her team are wonderful. And, uh, and I would encourage anybody to reach out to Kelly if they have more questions. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Thank Jason. you. Have a great one. Yeah. All right. See you. Thanks. See ya. Have a good one. Hey, say, let's talk about next week. Yes, we have Matt Bulliard, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Southway Builders joining us to talk about GC sub-partnerships. Yeah, GC, uh, sorry, GC owner partnerships. It's GC oh, okay. owner partnerships okay. with Matt. So yeah, so so Matt is yeah, with Southway Builders, and it's funny how this thing materialized. I have a, a really great um, relationship with uh, a, a developer uh, that does work across you know multiple states, and they're... Um, uh, leadership team, I, I said, you know, I'd really like to bring in a general contractor that gets partnership, that really understands how to partner with you as an owner. Um, and, uh, you know, I wonder if you would be, you know, if, there, if there's any GC that you, you'd like to connect. They didn't skip a beat. They said, uh, you should talk to Matt Bolliard at Southway. And awesome. uh, I was like, wow, that's a heck of an endorsement from their customer. And, uh, and you yeah. know, they were like, we'll introduce you. And I was like, I actually know Matt. So <laughs> like, that's easy. That's easy. I was like, they, they work across like 15 states. And, and, and they said, you should talk to Matt Bolliard right next to you. And I was like, oh, how funny is that? So, uh, yeah, so we're bringing in Matt um, and look forward to that conversation. Uh, yep. reminder as always, because every time we remind you, we get more. So keep them coming. Uh, send email, send Stacy an email. If you want to get added to our weekly list, uh, you'll get an email from steel toe communications that gives you a rundown on everything that's coming up in the next, um, uh, uh, you know, show and recordings of the previous show. Mm -hmm. Stacy, is there anything else that you want to uh, toss out there before we uh, sign off for the day? Nope. I think we're good to go. Just two more episodes left, right? Just two more episodes this season. Then we're back in the fall we and we'll crazy. reload. What are you going to do for two months, Stacey? Because I don't, I, I don't know if anybody, I don't even have a day job. This is just what I do. <laughs> this is what I, I just hang out here and do this. <laughs> it's been great, though. I love meeting the people that come on the show and the people that participate in the audience. It's been so great. So we'll start um, looking for guests for June, like we said. And um, if you're interested, please send me an email. Guess for September, just so that everybody's got that right. Yes, so we're, we're yep. We're wrapping up. We're stopping here in the in the, like the toward the end of June, and then we've got two months to reload. Uh, I think we have eight out of the thirteen guests uh, that we mm -hmm. want for next season lined up, or twelve guests. So we have four spaces left, and we'd really love to hear from anybody that uh, has a story to tell. So thank yeah. you. See you, Stacey. Right. Have a great one. Later. <laughs> See you.